<clears throat> so I think I can officially say um, this is the third time I've spoken here, and first time was Design Systems 1.0, and then 2.0, and now you're getting three. So this works perfect as a, a test crowd for um, making sure the series works. Um, and so since not everyone was here for every episode, and uh, you could probably go back and watch it, but you don't quite have time, we're going to do a super quick recap of kind of, oh, first, who I'm at, who I am, UX developer, UX. I, I don't make pretty pixels. I have no idea what a pretty pixel looks like, uh, but I can turn them into code pretty easily. Um, so what I want to do is run over just where we left off um, in the last couple talks that I've given uh, about design systems. The first one I did, um, this was almost four years ago now. Um, I put this talk together, and I think it's, it's really kind of like what landed me at Microsoft, was, was putting this talk together and really nailing it, was this talk called the Roadrunner Rules, or more to call Guidelines of a Design System. You uh, you recall the, the guidelines? Yeah, okay, pirates. Um, it, it was a really good good talk. And what it did is I, I took the talk to really describe what I felt the design system was, uh, all the way from um, talking about uh, visual language and languages itself, all the way into the design system, um, which I uh, defined as a set of rules and assets that define how to express everything a visual language needs to say. Should really have the date on here. It's like 2016 or something. Um, I still feel this this definition nails it. And this was also pre-280 characters. I did it in 140 characters. That's that's talent right there. Um, for me, this is really what it comes down to. is design system, it's rules and assets that all come together to help you to express, basically express, it's a language. So I need to be able to speak it, like expressing. Um, everything a visual language needs to say. So a visual language needs to say, I'm important. The design system will have rules and assets about how do we make something look important. And that's really what it boils down to and, and what it blows up into. So uh, that's what this talk kind of boiled down to. Um, I talked about how this worked really well for me when I was working at Red Hat um, uh, using like just their one website with their one theme. But then I joined Microsoft and realized that as I started working on Fabric, um, that we had lots of websites to support and we had lots of themes to support. So this, this, this paradigm that I had that went really well with like one website, one theme, just failed miserably as soon as we got into this, this situation where we need to support this really large ecosystem of applications. So that led me to Design Systems 2.0. And this is the notion of creating consistent user experiences. Um, and part of it too, I, I, I dove into TypeScript. Um, TypeScript was a large, large part of that. And that was part of this talk. Um, but really what it came down to is the trouble we had with CSS. Um, uh, usually it's tweets that kind of gather up my, my thought process as, as these talks come together, again, 2017. Um, that writing the correct CSS once, that's easy. Piece of cake job compared to everything else. Like give me a design, I can write CSS, good quality CSS that works and will represent your design faithfully. The challenge is making that CSS work in all situations and for all people. That is the hard part that we found. Um, we could write it once, and it worked for one application, one set of people, but once you start spreading it out, it gets really difficult. Because we ran into these kind of situations where um, we would have an application um, that was just one site, but it had many themes. And not just themes, like you could switch from this theme to that theme to that theme to that theme, but themes within themes, and the theme within the theme within the theme. Um, and sometimes they have a list, but no, it's themes, themes, themes all the way down. And like the situation here, we have a theme inside of a theme and then theme again. Like how do you do that with CSS without like iframing crap? Like it's very, very hard. Uh, and this was basically a SharePoint, it just broke our backs. And it was this problem right here in that we would have a set of styles and inside of that would be a basic sandbox, another set of styles that had to also include the original set of styles again inside of it. So all the tools that we typically had to our disposal um, just would not work. Um, the second situation was one page, but many themes, many different styles of buttons or multiple themes on the page or different parts of the page or different themes, whatever the situation was very difficult because you load a single set of CSS, that gives you a theme. Sure, you can like build two or three or four or five different themes. You can hypothetically load all those on the page, that gets super heavy quick, but six, seven, eight, 10, 20, 40, 50 user generated themes. How do you do that at runtime? You can't do the runtime, it has to be build time to use a regular CSS. So those are two things that were really, really difficult for us and led us down uh, uh, multiple paths 
that it wasn't just us, other people went down these paths as well, that led us to a CSS and JS solution. So the idea is that we needed to be able to evaluate styles in their context at runtime for our applications to be able to work. That means when the button renders on the page, it has to figure out, well, where, where am I in the page? And what theme is being applied to me before the CSS is actually evaluated and printed to the page? Not something you can do with static assets really well. Um, and I don't have my preview of what comes next. Um, okay, okay, and trust us, <laughs> this is hard. Um, and I didn't want to give away the next slide. Oh, close. Um, the, the interesting thing about this experience is we kept talking to other teams, large company, not everyone knows what the, what the other couple people are doing, left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing and whatnot. Um, and we'd, we'd talk to other teams that go through the exact same process of like, well first we tried this and then that didn't work for this reason. Then we tried this, but that didn't work for that reason. So now we've come on this solution, we think it's gonna solve everything, and like we just did the same thing like four months ago, the exact same progression. It's hard, trust us, it's not a lot of fun. Now, there's a big star up there. Um, because we had a particular constraint that not, not everyone has, some still have it, some still have even worse than our constraint, uh, but that big star right there was this big E. All right, um, that was our big caveat. It was like, well, we can do anything we want as long as it renders on IE 11. Like, really? Yeah, it's horrible. Yeah, exactly, you can't do everything you want. Um, as it turns out, um, uh, corporations screw us over uh, in, in many, many ways. And one of the ways they've done it the worst is um, having crap ton of legacy PCs within their businesses that all, actually just PCs and their applications, that only run in IE. And they're never gonna upgrade. It's gonna take them forever. SharePoint, like uh, I think they're around 45% IE traffic on SharePoint sites. Because they're all these like internal on-prem custom applications, blah, 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 that only run well in IE because that's all they tested in. And literally that's what's holding us back. So Assuming things change within the next short while, um, the new Edge built on Chromium, if you're not familiar with it, I'm not trying to sell Microsoft, besides we're trying to fix things as well as we can. Uh, the new Chromium for Edge, or, or Edge with Chromium, whatever you want to call it, um, is gonna change a lot of things. It's, it's going to bring um, parity with Chrome using Chromium Project, contributing back into Chromium to make Chromium better, faster, better battery life, better accessibility all those good things, but it's also gonna give us a spot where we can take this into all the way down to Windows 7. And this is going to run you know, modern Chromium as well as easily default back to Edge. So hopefully, cross your fingers, corporations pick up on this and go, we can run this, we get the best of both worlds, and we can move on past I-11. So it's a long pitch to say, hey, if we can move past I-11, what can we do? Because uh, in this design systems 3.0, I want to talk about you might not need CSS and JS with that one big caveat that you're not supporting that big E thing. Because uh, we're going to talk about CSS variables. And one thing that does not show up in I 11 at all is any CSS, var CSS variables whatsoever. Um, yes, you could fall back to non variable values, but that pretty much defeats the purpose of a lot of this work. Because if it just doesn't work, doesn't matter if it falls back to something, like the site's broken, and then SharePoint's not gonna be happy with that. So not a solution for us yet. So um, if you want these slides, I actually got the wild hair of like, there was the, you might, not, you might not need jQuery website. And I was like, you might not need CSS and JS. I'll get the domain. So you can find these slides that you might not need CSS in JS, no dashes or anything, .com, uh, and you can get to that. I, I might make it something more interesting in the future, but for now you get these slides. I just thought it would be a fun thing to have. All right. So um, the weirdest thing from this angle, that's purple and that's gray. It's really weird. And then, okay, anyway, moving on. So one site with many themes. Um, so we, we tackled this in the past with uh, basically JavaScript. We're, we're, we're using React. So theme, run, theme one can render and it goes, hey, I don't have a, any other contextual theme, I'll just render. Theme two says, oh, I'm a new theme, render anything inside of here using the contextual theme. You have a button and a drop down and a call out and a blah, 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 use theme number two. And then inside of that, there's another little box that gets the new context. And that one says, hey, I'm actually theme number one. So if you render inside here, you know, use, use theme one values again. So we, in the past, have done this with, uh, with React and React context to be able to inject those themes into the, uh, uh, into the CSS calculator, the styling calculations at runtime. Um, 
So I'm going to dig back through about like what are the possible solutions here. If you're not going to use um, uh, CSS or JS, if you want static uh, CSS, uh, how did we do this in the past before it got way complicated? Well, one approach, which does not work by the way, but we'll, we'll dig through it, um, is the notion of scope styles. And this, if you've been in front end for long enough, this is kind of how we did things in the past. Um, where we had two different style sheets, one's our dog style sheet, one's uh, a cat style sheet, and yes, I know content is not an actual value. I had suit, I had like afters there before, and like that's just not necessary. So uh, uh, animal in the dog CSS is a dog, and animal in the cat CSS is a cat, and we wanna be able to use both of those inside of our application without one trouncing over the other. So one thing we could do using SAS or whatever is import um, one style sheet into a cat prefix, and one dog into a dog prefix. Um, in the end, just basically giving us this, dot cat dot animal is a cat dot dog dot animal is a dog. So if you're in the dog context, get a dog. If you're in the cat context, get a cat. And it kind of works. We've, we've, we've done this so much like, oh, if it's in a sidebar, the button is different. If it's a footer, it's this. It works fine if you have like an ID that like that's the only place that ever shows up. But as I said, this works fine. Um, the animal inside the dog is a dog, animal inside the cat is a cat. Uh, but if we take the cat and we move it up inside of the dog, we now have this, uh, this div, I can point to, yay, uh, oh, you can't see that at all, that sucks. Okay, um, the, the second animal down there, it's inside both contexts. It's inside of cat, but it's also inside of dog. And CSS does not care that cat's closer than dog, they're, they're both uh, the selectors both match, uh, the, or the, uh, it matches both selectors. So all it's going to do is take whatever one comes second in the cascade, and that just breaks your animals. And that would be great if it worked this way, but CSS does not work that way, um, as much as we've tried. So the next thing you could probably do is say, well, part of it is having that descendant selector, you know, having just some parent. Well, what if we, um, instead of, having a parent selector, we just combine it together with the, with the suffix. So um, instead of having dot cat and, and um, or having uh, animal from cat, animal from dog style sheets, um, we'll, we will append like the style sheet name onto the end of the class. So we have unique classes for each one. And this definitely does work. And this will give you a class for, for cat that gives you a cat and dog gives you a dog. Um, you can also do this in CSS modules because it's really annoying to have to con you know, constantly maintain, say that's a version instead of cat and dog, like version six, version seven, version eight. It's really annoying to have to go through the entire code base and update those class names to match the new CSS. It sucks. So something like CSS modules um, gets you to that point where you can just import your, your, um, your class names, and it'll automatically put that scoping value onto it. And this works pretty well. This gets us really close to where we wanna get this as well is, is typically the output you'll get when you're using um, CSS and JS as well. Um, the notion being that if you have two class names, both animal, but they have different values inside of them, it'll find it, it'll basically create a new hash for each so that they never conflict. So you're starting with animal as a class name, that's what's in your code, but it's gonna generate a different hash for each one so that the, the class name up top and the class name down the below, or I guess selector, and class name down below will all match up. So that's kind of the, the approach we end up having to take using CSS and, CSS and JS to make sure that those class names were unique, and if we updated the version um, or had a new theme or something, that those did not collide. So that works great and all, but there's a number of problems with it. Um, excuse me. Um, you need a lot of runtime uh, JavaScript to make all that happen. You need to be able to validate and make sure that class names weren't already being used. Um, and if they were used, then you need to make sure you're not duplicating and doing like extra class names. So you have to clean all the class names up and so on and so forth. It's, it gets messy pretty quick. Um, then you have performance implications of doing all those calculations on the page. So it would be great if we could just use CSS variables. Um, CSS variables or custom properties um, have been around for a while, like a good long while. But again, no support in IE11 whatsoever, not even a polyfill, just don't even think about it. So not a lot of us have got a chance to really play with them. So, pop quiz. Get your pencils ready. So again, a tweet, this was a great one. This ended up picking up a ton of steam. Um, this was um, when I, I, I found something about CSS variables and I was like, wow, I wonder how many people actually know this or not. And so this tweet did exactly that. So I have a style book up top with, a, with, a, with an ID of blue 
that has a variable declaration of blue. So basically, I can use that to apply and say any variables inside here of, of um, my variable set the value to blue. So it's, 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 it's a setting. Uh, it doesn't pull blue, it's setting the value of blue. Um, and then I have a class name that's red, and uh, that's setting my variable to red. Then down below, I've got an inline style. Ooh, inline styles, those are super specific, right? All right, um, and I'm setting the value to pink. And then my DOM structure, I've got the ID next, class next, and on the span, the spans where I'm actually uh, um, trying to grab that value. Like, what is my, what is the my va uh, variable value at that given time? Um, I want my hello world to look that color. So everything else is trying to specify what the variable uh, value is, just like, you know, let foo equals one, two, three kind of thing. Um, and then this is the actual reading the variable out in the span. All right, so I put that out as a quiz. Um, and I got some really inter interesting responses. It was a lot of fun. So um, let's dig back and remember how the classes work because this is where a lot of the confusion comes from. Um, a lot of us are used to this notion of, well, parent selectors, well, obviously specificity is a big deal about that because, you know, dot cat animal and dot dog animal, well, that's the same specificity. If one was an ID, well, that would definitely win and so forth. So we're, we're used to this notion of a, like a descendant selector um, and specificity being the first thing you look at and then um, uh, uh, cascade being the second thing. So we're used to that, you know, if it was dog, that's definitely going to win. But for dealing with CSS variables, um, I'm trying to think what I'm saying, exactly saying here, um, we have, it's very similar to this situation, the, the little test I gave on Twitter. Uh, what if you have this animal and you're saying, well, content is equal to variable of animal. Um, and um, yes, okay, I was like, I need some context here, I think. Um, and the animal is inside of cat, and inside of dogs, which one wins? We, we know in, if it was just a descendant selector for CSS, well, dog would win, because that's a higher specificity, and that'd be, the, if they both matched, and then, then dog would have higher specificity. But here, which one does it pull from? What, what does that animal variable um, actually come out to? Because um, it's pointing to both. And, and the ID is higher specificity, cat's lower specificity, which ones are gonna be? Um, and it, kind of just make a quick adjustment to it. This is basically um, getting back to our original concept of class names, would it just be like DOM order, like if it wasn't ID versus class. So let's look at the results of the poll. And you can see it's pretty mixed. I was actually really impressed. There were 2,500 votes on this, which I was super, super thrilled by. A um, bunch of random people picked it up and retweeted it. It just, it got out there pretty viral. It was great, because it's nice to get a really good wide sample. And we had a lot of people say pink. And they said pink because that's an inline style. Anyone knows inline styles, they trump any IDs or class names that might be associated with it. If you say div um, style background blue, that thing's gonna be blue almost regardless. Um, a good number of people um, also said blue um, because that's an ID and that one's more specific than the class name. Um, and less than half of the uh, respondents said red, which is the class name that's just right above that span. So let's look at this and see what is right. So in the situation where we have cat and we have dog, dog's the second one in the list, um, what are we gonna get when dog's on the outside, cat's on the inside, and for our animal? We're actually going to get cat. And people are like, but, but dog, there's the same specificity, and dog comes after in the, in the, in the, in the cascade. Doesn't make sense until we start remembering that these aren't necessarily, these aren't selectors, They're like we're not, CSS variables are not selectors. CSS variables are custom properties. And if you've worked with properties before, um, a good example of property is, say, font color. If the dog said font color was green and cat said font color was white, animal would definitely be white because those properties are inherited from the closest relative. So say like if it was a background, well, that's just the background of the div, but like a font size, font color, line height, all those things are inherited by their children. It's always inherited by the, the, the nearest parent that has that value. So CSS variables do the exact same thing. And what that means is regardless, let's see if I have, um, yeah, so the exact same thing. Um, so white, brown, so it's gonna be white text because uh, the white one is closer to it. Um, 
And what that also means is we can nest and nest and nest and nest and nest. And it doesn't matter how deep that is, how specific something above, uh, else above it is, doesn't matter at all. It's going to go to the nearest parent, find the values from that, and use those values. So that animal is always going to be a dog, regardless of whatever DOM is around it. So CSS variables are really interesting because they're so different from what we're used to with all these, uh, all these like parent classes. Um, so with CSS variables, we can do this type of layout where we have a button, it opens a contextual menu um, that's an opposite theme of the page. Um, it has a button inside of it that's the opposite theme of the original button. It opens up a tooltip that's yet again the opposite of the container it's in. All without writing any custom code because we can do all these nestings because all this tooltip needs to know, what's my parent? What theme is being applied for my parent? Doesn't matter, there's been you know, five or six themes already applied. We can nest them as much as we want as long as the parent theme provides the right CSS variables, we know everything works. So that's kind of the mind bender of CSS variables. Realizing that it gives us the ability to, if you're, like, who uses React? Do you? More people use React. Okay, React Context is really awesome. Uh, React Context basically give you, gives you JavaScript context, which you can wrap around something and everything inside of that basically just it knows what, what it can pull from context. And if you put that inside of some other context, who cares? Like I've got my context, it's what's, what's right around me. Um, and CSS variables give you the same ability. Um, and in React, that's exactly what we use. Context would hold a theme. If you had a new theme inside of it, it would just be a new context, and so on and so forth. So that's the beauty of CSS variables, is they work different than what we're used to with regular CSS. Any quick questions on that? Does that make sense, the difference? Happy to talk more afterwards as well. But that is the key to understanding um, why CSS variables are so important to us. So um, the next thing, take it one step further, uh, if your mind's not blown enough yet, is we've got a situation where we've got one page and many themes. So in, um, uh, let's see, what do I have in here? Yeah, so two buttons, no big problem. Three buttons, four buttons, five buttons, six buttons. If you have app teams, you know they're gonna ask for a different color button every single time. Um, and it might not just be one where it's like, oh, all of our buttons are red. Like, well, I need a green button too and a pink one and we've got this marketing campaign that needs a yellow and so on and so forth down the road. How do you support all these different colors? Um, and there's a lot of really horrible ways to do it um, and there's some good ways to do it. So with Plato CSS, you could do it this way. You could have specific classes for each one. And that specific class would have all the styles you need for that blue or that green button. That's really obnoxious because you end up duplicating tons of code like the color white and all the other values. As soon as you need more of them, you have to create more of them and more of them and more of them. Um, and it doesn't really scale well when you end up needing basically an infinite number of these different variations. Um, another way you can do it is like a base class where you've got a button class name. And it has all of like your kind of your root values, all of your like you know, standard color and a standard background and font size and um, line heights and all that kind of stuff. And then you have like another class name that like just changes one value of it. So um, you know, buttoned up, you know, my blue button gives a, uh, a blue background. Um, so that works okay, um, but you're also, you're, you're changing specificity here. You've now gone from uh, one specificity to two specificity. So if you have a system that expects specificity to be constant, um, you basically just told your partners, well, just override our styles with something more specific, uh, and then everything will be fine until you come back and like, uh, well, if it's class disabled, it'll be great. Well, no, not anymore, because we've got button blue background. You just screwed things up. Anyway, a rabbit hole, it gets bad. Do not change specificity. It's not a good solution for solving your problems. Um, so in comes CSS and JS. That's, again, how we solved everything in the past, because we could still have one class name, one specificity and evaluate what those styles should be. So um, we have a button component and there's a styles function or styles prop that has some function that returns a bunch of styles for the blue button and a function that returns styles for the green button. And that works decently. Um, and I guess it's kind of what we want again with that like gives a, a hash name at the end. So if you, um, you know, one of them has blue, one has green, they can be different hashes. If they end up having the same values, they'll use the same hash and you'll be saved some bits there. Um, I'm trying to remember where, where it goes after this. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> but this isn't always super performant um, because um, sometimes you have lots and lots and lots and lots of buttons on the page. So in this case here, um, this is the shapes 
drop down inside of um, um, uh, Excel, I think. Um, and honestly, this is an example. Excel team came to us and said, our drop down performance is horrible because we have to render 80, 90 glyphs on the page. Each one of them is calculating their styles. Like, okay, cool, all right. We can get some better caching in there. I know it. We can get some caching in there. Everything will be fine. And it wasn't really fine, but at least it got a little better. But then you start looking at this. You're like, oh, shit. All right. That's a whole lot of buttons on the page. That's a whole lot of colors on the page. These are colors that users can actually choose and select. And like depending on, on the, the color of the background, you might need to change the foreground. And like this gets really messy really fast and really difficult to do in a performant way as anytime this page loads, anytime a prop changes, we have to recalculate all the styles. So we pretty quickly hit a limit on our approach of CSS and JS. Um, we realized we can't rely on runtime to calculate every single style for every single button on the page because of situations like that. So in comes CSS variables. What can they do here? All right. So um, if we take back to the CSS variables approach, we can dig in a little bit of the anatomy of a custom property. So we can see we have a button, um, button class to apply to our button. Um, background, color, font size. Uh, if you're not used to custom properties, uh, the syntax is uh, declare variable of the, uh, the VR um, uh, keyword, and in the parentheses, um, oh sorry, this is to to use, sorry, to use the variable. Um, so you call a variable, um, and then you tell it what variable do I want, and all variables start with dash dash. I don't know why, it's really weird, but that's what they decided on. Um, and then a fallback value. So if that, that background value isn't available, use gray, use black, use 16 pixels. Uh, and that's great, because you can say, if I'm given some other value, use it. But if not, just fall back to this value in here, uh, and life is fine. And that fallback can actually be another variable, or another vari variable, and so on and so forth. So it's pretty, pretty customizable. And then we can do this. We can actually apply CSS variables via a class. Doesn't have to even be via context. So we were doing it in context before, where like we had you know, class names, uh, or we had CSS variables set at a context, and stuff inside of it would pick up on that context. But here we want like we want a bunch of different buttons on the page, all with different styles on them in a performant way. So we don't have to recalculate styles all the time. Um, so doing this, we can create a class name that has a background, text, and size all encapsulated in it. We can do the same thing with green. And then we can take that class name of blue and attach it to our button. And you might be saying, Micah, we already talked about this. That fucks with specificity. The great thing is it does not. It does not change the specificity of, back it up, of the background that's being applied to this button is dot button, a single class. Me adding that blue uh, variable class doesn't actually change specificity. It just changes the context that it's in. So instead of using gray, it's using blue and green. That's pretty amazing. So now on, a, on the fly, we can create a class name that just changes variables um, that get picked up by the control inside of it without changing specificity. We can create these uh, on the fly, we can create these custom, they're not gonna screw with anything. That They're built basically to take a prop. So if, if you use components to take props in, these variables are basically a prop that the component can take in. Um, and if you wanna see that really in action, let's take a look at the next example. Because we don't have to use class names for this. We can have a class of button, which again, applies those styles to it that have the variables in it and fallbacks. Uh, but instead of applying a separate class name or a context or something which brings those background text and size values in, we can just do it right in line. We can create a style attribute. We can specify our variable values right inside of that, and the button will pick those values up. That is literally like a React prop right there, being able to pass those values in, uh, changing the appearance of the control um, you can package those up as a little const that you can drop into the styles function anywhere. It's an amazing way to be able to package, package those styles up in a way that's not going to affect the outcome of that button or the specificity or anything. Um, another really nice thing that variables do, and you're like, well, I could have done, actually, I'll back up. Um, I could have just done that with style, background blue, text white, size 18, and it would have been fine, right? I could have done the same thing, just blow them away, don't worry about, like, um, don't worry about specificity at all. Um, for one, worry about specificity, it, it's, it's really handy. Um, but two, uh, what variables allow you to do is not just have, um, you don't have to have values with a single purpose values. 
One thing we really like with variables is the idea that they can mean multiple things. They can actually be um, uh, evaluated on, especially in JavaScript. Like, you know, this is a, if it's above 10, do this. If it's below 10, do that. Um, so with nice thing with CSS variables, we can actually reuse those values or values or, um, or or maybe like do functions on them or transforms on them or something. Um, so in this case, we've got a button that can also be a split button, and we've got this background hover of yellow that we're passing in. What's really great is that um, that background of, of yellow can be used in multiple ways. In a standard button, it's just a background, hover over it, you get yellow. Um, but in, the, in my button, you don't have to specify like the button and the split button background and so on and so forth. You can just say when you hover on it, you get yellow, whether it's the main section or the split section. And we do that because, or we, we do that by the fact we can reuse that variable. We can have that variable anywhere we want inside of our style sheet. We can have that like that height value, that pixel value of height, um, like five places, like in line height and size and padding, and use calc values to like you know cut it in half and like do whatever you want with those values inside of there multiple times. You can use that as logic inside of your styling. So the same way here that we can just use that background value and, and use it multiple places if we have a regular button or like a you know primary secondary button. We can reuse those values. We can evaluate them. We can do calculations on them. You can, I, I actually I did one that was interesting. I was like, can you do a, like a Boolean value? And I realized, well, if you have a value that's, um, if, if you multiply something by that value, you can pass in one or zero and easily turn it on or off. So if you want to like turn a shadow on or off or something like that, you can have a, a Boolean basically as a CSS variable. You can easily calc by that value, you know, calculate by that variable and easily turn things on and off. So really flexible, they really act like props. They don't change specificity. They work just like context in React. They're really everything we dreamed for except for that big nasty E. So next time you reach for some CSS and JS, well first check if you need IE11 support. And if you do, well wait just a little bit more because hopefully life is gonna be um, moving along a little faster than we had feared. Um, and uh, if, you, if you are able to go without IE11, um, think about CSS variables instead, because they uh, let the browser do those calculations. Let the browser do those restyling. If your theme changes, let the browser do the work, because that's what it's built to do, and stop trying to do everything in, in JS just because we can. So I think that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Would love some. Hey, he works here. You, you yeah. go first. Um, what was the answer to Oh, oh, sorry, yeah, it was, I, I guess I didn't actually add that in, did I? Um, I could probably go through and, and work on those couple slides. The, 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 the drama wasn't quite there as I was hoping. Um, so the answer was, the answer was red. So people got it right. So red was, is the closest value. So the blue, the pink, all that doesn't matter. Um, think about the same thing if that was, if that class applied like a font, a font color or something, you'd pick that one up because it's a custom property. It's not a specificity question. No. Yep. But as you can see, half people got it wrong, yeah. which I was like, yes, this is what people need to know. Because uh, obviously I'm, I'm not trying to point out that they're stupid. I am pointing out that people don't know this about custom properties, and it really, really changes the way they get used, as we demonstrated here. Is there a question? Uh -huh. um, so say in that last example, yes, that's the one where you're like, okay, this is great, I have my button, um, and, and I'm already maybe using one of those context modifying classes that's really a little yep. different that would change it from gray to blue, right? Um, but now I also want to change my font size. Uh -huh. Is that another class? Just like blue to blue, but just changes the font size for that one scenario? Or um, that in that case, like, Honestly, I would probably do things more inline than these class names. Um, but definitely, when, when you start getting into, well, there's a class name that says it's red, and there's an inline that says it's blue, that's where you start getting the specificity of like which one of those values is going to win that's applied directly to it. Um, so I would probably have like a system for applying their values to, uh, uh, to components, and maybe it's all inline. I mean, if you're working in React, you know, it's pretty easy just to, to drop that blob into styles and, and apply it that way. Um, 
um, then you wouldn't have to worry about, well, this one's a class, this one's not. Um, yeah, and then you could easily mix them together. You could just you could you could bring in the green, but then um, override the 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 size value in the object, and then drop that in. Or um, um, so if you have an image that's a different like style, it sets the size variable to be the green size there. Yes, if you had an in Yep. Yeah, at that point, it's specificity of like which if there's if there's multiple that are applied at the same level. Um, then that you know that specificity would win, uh, but again, like it depends on context. Um, um, I, I would basically I would say have a good rule of thumb about how you apply those styles, whether maybe everything's inline or everything's utility class. Um, and um, yeah, I mean you do eventually get back to some specificity stuff, but at least it's just deciding which variable is gets used, which is typically just a user concern um, and not really a, like a design system concern because again like. You never want to make a change to a component and like break its like disabled styles or some accessibility or something like that. So those those, those variables should pretty much always be in your domain completely. Cool. Any other questions? Go have fun with CSS variables. Go do it. Go rethink your CSS and JS. Um, yeah, there's there's not a lot of things I think that are left. I, I think. There's an ergonomics that's still really um, popular in, uh, in moving your CSS into JavaScript. You have like your React component with all the logic and all the view, and like, oh, here's a const that has all my styles in it. Totally get it. It's still super useful, super easy. Um, there's nothing to say you can't continue to use that to create a class name that you just inject in and use CSS variables to do all your theming. So not saying that moving CSS into, into JavaScript is a bad idea. But I think we can move away from doing a lot of the, um, basically the runtime evaluations of styles for theming and context, those kind of things, as you're able to move over more into CSS variables. How do you author? I don't care. If you want to, if you want to use JS, it's fine. Can you combine CSS and JS? Yes. Yeah. It's kind of exactly what I was talking about. So if you're a big fan of like JSS, um, like go for it. Like JSS at the end of the day takes a bunch of styles and generates a class name. There's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. Um, you can probably even optimize some of this to like automatically export all of your styles and like create a style sheet and just inject, inject a style sheet. Um, we're, we're trying to do some optimizations where uh, we, never, um, we never calculate um, uh, we never calculate styles at render time. We basically calculate it kind of at boot time. So like we know all of the components that are beyond the page when we render, and we can put all those into the head, and we we only ever reevaluate styles if a theme changes. So that's what you want to avoid. You want to you want to make sure like if you've got a hundred glyphs to print, you just print them all and not worry about the class or about the styles of them. If you have a, a green glyph in there, you specify that at the beginning so that we know there's a green and a regular, so you can just print them all. That one has a different class name. We don't have to worry about evaluating styles once we hit that in the DOM node. So yeah, again, do whatever you want as far as um, how you author styles, I don't care. Um, but we can certainly move away from like needing to, we'll have runtime, we'll check the context and grab the font size and do this and that for theming. We start moving and using uh, CSS variables to do a lot of that. Or like customizing, oh, I need a pink button. How do I make a pink button? We'll just you know pass props through and change the value, values of that return class name. That's horrible because then every single component needs to be checked to see if that prop is in there, to see if it should use that class and so forth for the styles. Um, so moving things with customizations and theming to CSS variables uh, is super performant, it's incredibly quick. We've done some tests where like even our fastest CSS and JS and then CSS variables did like a big shift of like hundreds of components on a page and CSS variables just smokes it every time. It's just incredibly fast and efficient um, and definitely the, the, the most performant way to get this done. Um, you put enough of them on the page that you can see the difference. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think we're, we're, there's probably like you can probably get into. Um, and actually, it, it probably is a bit of this too. Um, like you could get into the performance tab and like actually see like the calculations being ran and so forth. But I mean, when, when it's when it's apparent enough that you can just like count and go like, yeah, that was way faster. <laughs> yeah, uh, or you know, run times and whatnot. Um, uh, there's and there's another one just kind of to, to throw this out. There's also a um, 
oh, what's it called? Fl like a flame graph? Um, I'm gonna use flame graph. Yeah, so it's these guys. And I don't know, maybe it's a React flame graph. Um, we've actually been using this recently. I don't know if it's this project specifically, um, three or two stars. Um, oh, that's horrible. Um, but it, it, it basically does this. It, it goes through, it, it, um, it will go through and it will uh, render the component like 100 times and then do an aggregate. Because we're not trying to do milliseconds because it's uh, processes and like, does the clock tick at the wrong time, can screw things up. Um, but we're able to actually track um, uh, like how much render time is being taken up from this function, how much render time is taken up from this function, how long is calculating styles and so forth. And we actually see all of that stuff. Um, <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> um, and if you um, if you're curious, what's really fun is um, if I know where. Um, gosh, where is our? Um, I don't even know where the link is. Um, all the work we do, um, this Fabric repo is completely open source. Um, so even all the tooling that we do is open source. Um, and I'm curious, I know we've implemented this recently, I'm, I'm wondering if they show up. Um, we actually run flame graphs as perf analysis. Yes. Um, so these are, um, these are all the tests that we run. Um, and again, it's not milliseconds, because we like do a bunch of them and then like kind of average the time out. Uh, but you can see we have a couple different buttons that we're running and we're checking the uh, performance of each one of them as we make changes. Um, and then right now the new button's not actually keeping up. Um, and looking like at a different scenarios of like a, like a details row or you know this really big one of a split button. Um, but anyway, then we can dig in and actually look at that flame graph. Yeah, perfect. Um, and you can actually see where the different um, calculations, where, where, where time is being spent. Um, and like, yeah, here's the base button render. There's an on render of the content, um, getting native props. There's an assign filtering. Yeah, so that's time it takes to like filter probably Filter props or something like that. Um, assign props, filter props, yeah. Anyway, so we're able to actually to break that down and see this from like a PR to PR basis. Um, and this is completely open source. Check it out, use it. Um, the tool we did is called Flame Grill, I think. And you're just generating that stuff with the API. The block. <laughs> I know. Um, and where is it? I think it's at, um, pretty sure it's under this. Somewhere, dear Lord. Um, we need a better name, apparently. Um, Flame Girl JS. Okay, Flame Girl. Yeah, there we go. Sweet. Um, this is us, I believe. Yeah. Yay, good right, right there. So, um, yeah, so we built some tooling like that because that's one of the challenges. We make changes to a control. We say we, um, you know, we're doing a, a new button and like our old one's slow and, and, and whatnot, and we want to try and do something different and different implementation with some different functionality and some different ways to customize it and different way to calculate the styles and so forth. And we wanted to be able to make sure we can test between new and old, um, see which one's performing faster. Uh, and it was gonna make changes, does actually make a change, a positive change or a negative change. So yes, we're, we're, we're trying, we're, we're trying to get, we're, we're getting a little bit better. Um, Cause we're realizing as we do all this work, we really need to have quantitative like analysis of it to make sure we're doing the right things. A little bit of a tangent, but yeah. Any other questions? We're good? Oh. Yes, you can 100%. Yep, yep. Now, if, if it wasn't for IE, like when I joined three, some like I joined three years ago, and when we came across these problems, I was like, oh, I bet we could do this with CSS variables. This is three years ago, like, you know, ages ago in the internet history. Uh, and I was like, oh, I-11, never mind. All right, we'll keep going down that path. And eventually that path led us to, um, to a CSS, CSS and JS solution. And um, yeah, I-11 is basically the bane of our existence. And, and we're happy to see it die in a fiery grave as well. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we, we party every day. Every time it like, just, just dies a little bit more, we, 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 we come alive inside. It's, it's pretty wonderful. Because um, I mean, we'll, we'll pretty soon, I mean, a couple of years, who knows how long it's going to take. So everything's evergreen. I mean, Edge is evergreen. Chrome is evergreen. Fi Firefox evergreen. Like, we should be able to do like current browser and two back, which means anything in the last three months, we should be able to support that and have that as our lit list. So that's a 
pretty exciting place to be. We've really never been in this in the industry in you know the 20, 30, some odd years that, that we've been doing web development. So we're pretty excited what that means. Um, the interesting enough are the new controls that we're building, we're taking an approach where we don't want it tied to any CSS approach. So basically supply it with class names is really the only contract we have for styling. And those class names could be generated at runtime, they could be a static uh, a file sheet, they could be CSS class names that are dropped in. It's like, that's the only styling interface we want to support because that means we could, we'll, we'll still do CSS and JS now because we have to do that to support um, I11, but eventually we could easily move over to a static style sheet and use that um, without having to do anything to mess with the controls. So uh, be forward thinking with that. We might not be able to get, um, not, maybe not there yet, but maybe you could even AB of like, here's you know styles that will work with these components that aren't I11 compatible and these ones are and you can pick which ones you want. So that's even possible. Um, I know some of our apps are actually serving different apps to I11 than they are to modern browsers. So they get to use that. So um, you'd be surprised. I mean, there's, there's ways to get around and um, use modern technology in even Microsoft size applications. So um, yeah, and if nothing else, plan for a year or two years down the road when this really becomes a reality and, and you're not like, oh, we just invested so much time in a baked in CSS and JS solution that we can't get rid of because then you are kind of stuck. So yeah, if you have other questions, um, I'll stick around for a bit. I think we're going for beers down a trap door as well afterwards. And um, yeah, happy to, I can talk about this all night long. <laughs> all right, thanks again. <laughs>